Very good morning to you, and we're so glad each of you are here this morning. There are a few people that are away and some traveling, and we miss them. But I'm glad each of you are here, and I pray this message will be a blessing to you. I feel blessed just to be able to share it with you, and so welcome. How do you deal with change? How do you deal with change? And I'm sure your answer says that depends. <laughs> do you like change? And I think the answer to that one is that too depends. Depends on whether it's my change or your change. But change is a part of life. Some quotes about change, and then we're going to really think about change as we look at the scripture. Comedian Jeff Foxworthy, he thinks about change. And uh, when he thinks about change, the first thing that came to his mind, keeping in mind he's a comedian, he says, diapers. <laughs> diapers. You change them and you change them. And you have to keep changing them every day. And those directions on the side of the box, the pampers, it says, hold 6 to 12 pounds, and they're not kidding. <laughs> Change. Our scripture reading this morning is, as we continue in this series message from Ecclesiastes, is from chapter 3. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. Lord, bless this reading of his word. Wisdom for life, part two. <laughs> Seasons of change. And as I said, we, we deal with change in different ways. Most of us, don't like change unless we're initiating that change. As I said, Foxworthy thinks a lot about change and he's one of my comedians I like to enjoy. He has another one about diapers and he said, uh, changing a diaper is a lot like getting a present from your grandmother. You're not sure what you've got, but you're pretty sure you're not gonna like it. <laughs> Change is a part of life, just like seasons. And we can look at changes in different ways. Wayne Dyer said, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. That's profound. Sir Winston Churchill once said, to improve is to change. 
To be perfect is to change often. That's Churchill. God wants us to grow. That is change. Over and over again, the scriptures call on us to grow and to change. Peter wrote, grow, that means change, (laughs) grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord. Paul wrote, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, changed by the renewing of your mind. Friday night during our movie night, Russell Greenwood talked about accepting change. And he quoted the serenity prayer, remember Russell? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And the second half of that, the longer version, Russell, would you finish it? So in the courage to, to know the dif- the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as he did, the simple world as is, not as I should have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will so that I may be reasonably happy in this world and supremely happy in the next. Thy will be done, not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a wonderful prayer, is it not? It covers and everything. It covers everything. The Bible has so much to say about change and how we view it, how we consider it. And today I want to use this chapter in Ecclesiastes to talk about change. Valuable lessons for life. (laughs) It sure is. Have you noticed we live in a world where things are always changing? Change can be hard for people. But notice again these words from the writer. To everything, that's not leaving out anything. To everything, there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Uh, I've got some other translations which say it just a little bit differently, but I love the insight we get from them. This is the New King James Version. The NIV said, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. And the New American Standard Version says, listen, it's... To everything, there is an appointed time and an appropriate time for every matter. With this verse, Solomon explains to us the idea that there is an appropriate time for all of life's experiences and expectations. God has planned it that way Change is a part of God's plan. And we can fight it. (laughs) We sometimes do, like many do with aging, (laughs) cosmetic surgery, and so many efforts to fight it. But we also can learn and gain wisdom for living and see the beauty in every season. God wants to give us this wisdom. In Ecclesiastes 3, Solomon shares with us examples and gives explanations about this concept that for everything there is a season and an appointed time, a God-appointed time. We'll notice how he uses opposites as a means of covering everything in between. Verses 2 through 8 are actually a poem that Solomon wrote with 14 opposites. This poem was written into a very popular song. Some of you will remember it by the birds. Turn, turn, turn. Do you remember that song from the 60s? It was popular through the 70s and beyond. There is a season. 
Well, I want to take just a few minutes this morning to look at each of these in this chapter and make some applications of them about change for us. Some of these changes are purely the act of God, and others depend on the will of man, our own choices. So beginning in verse 2, we read, A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what was planted. None of us asked to be born. It was something done to us. None of us want to experience death, but it is something allowed by God as part of the consequence of sin. And if the Lord should tarry, we all have an appointment with death that we will keep someday. It's wise to understand this. Moses wrote in the Psalms, he says, Teach us, O Lord, to number our days. Give us wisdom to know how to use the days you've given us. Solomon uses agriculture or planting as an example. The farmer has a goal when he plants. The goal is to produce a large, healthy crop of some kind. And we understand that the farmer cannot get a successful crop unless he properly goes through the seasons required to produce a crop. This requires him to do certain things at the right time, the appointed time, the appropriate time, like preparing the soil, cultivating, fertilizing, weeding, and harvesting. Otherwise, he won't be successful in bringing in the crop that he desires. And at a time, there's a time to pluck, to pluck up what is planted. This deals with both the harvest of what's to come uh, to maturity in the crops, but also the removal of what is no longer fruitful, what has grown fruitless and useless and needs to be removed. This is part of the work that we're given to do by our Creator. There is an appropriate time for everything. If we get out of sync, we can get into trouble and we can get frustrated. Verse 3 continues to express these important themes, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up. There's a place for proper judgment, and thankfully there's a balance to it, which includes healing and a return of mercy and comfort. In this fallen world, things are often wearing out. Even our bodies go through this. A time to break down. Our vision and our hearing, I hear about this, <laughs> diminish over time. Our hair changes color and thins out. Growing older is a part of life as it now exists. God has determined this. And no matter what we may think about it, it's going to continue that way. This is what Solomon is telling us. And as he continues in verse 4, he says, A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. No one's going to escape the hurts that come in this life, the sorrows that come in this life. And even when God's own son came, he experienced these times. He was not handed a life with everything pleasant and delightful, free from pain and struggle. No, rather, the Bible says he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In a fallen world, there'll be times of hurt and sorrow and weeping, there will be times of grief and tears, a time to mourn. But thankfully, there are also times to laugh, times to dance. Thank you, Lord. I think of weddings. Those are always a great, joyful time, as Ken mentioned earlier. Uh, these weddings have been like this in practically every culture, a time to dance. I remember when Michelle and I went to a wedding, a wedding, and I don't think she'd ever seen me dance. But it was celebration time, and I was a little goofy and crazy, but we had so much fun rejoicing 
with that couple. Dancing. Do you know the Lord dances over you? When you're delighting in him, he delights in you and dances over you? Somehow, I don't understand all that, but the scripture says he does. He delights over us. The verse that follows, he says, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. There is a time to break things down and a time to build them up again. This is particularly hard to do with physical and social structures, but even to relationships with others. There's a time when we need to embrace others and to show our support for them. But there's also a time when we ought to refuse to embrace, when our support would be misunderstood or would be complicity in something that's evil. Those times come from the hand of God as well. Another contrast is given in verses 6 and 7 where he says there's a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow. There is a time to seek work, marriage, new friends, and an appropriate time to give something up that was lost. There comes a time in life when we should curtail certain things, even sometimes friendships or change our jobs. For instance, and sometimes lose or let go of something that we had in the past. It is a proper and appropriate for these as well. There are values and standards which we must never surrender. Well, there are other times when we need to throw some things away, clean out our attic, the garage, or throw away some old clothes. <laughs> I smile at my wife because we talk about that from time to time. There's a time to accumulate and there's a time to liquidate. This is true of many parts of life, including habits and attitudes. Resents, resentments need to be thrown away. Grudges and long-standing hurts need to be forgiven, forgotten, and let go of. The writer continues, and he says, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. There are times when we know something, and we should keep it in confidence. But there are other times when we ought to speak. And there are times when we ought to speak when we're keeping a secret would be harmful to someone or would fail to reveal an important truth that needs light. There's a time to speak up. And there are other times when we need to keep silent. In verse 8, he goes on to say a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. When is it a time to hate? Do you know the scripture says there are things that God hates? In Proverbs, it says uh, six things the Lord hates, seven things he detests. The scriptures tell us to hate what is evil. I think of young Abraham Lincoln as a young, young man, and he first went out of the state that he was in into a state that permitted slavery, and he saw the sale of young slaves being sold on a market. And he, he says that when he saw this, he felt hatred rising up inside his own heart at the evil that he saw. And he resolved in his heart, he said, if ever I get the chance to end slavery, I will do so. And some 30 years later, he would be elected president and would make that one of his important missions. There is a time to love, and when is it the right time? 
When it's the right time, we should extend our love to somebody who's hurting, somebody who's feeling dejected or rejected, lonely or weak. We must remember this. When evil or tyranny rides roughshod over the rights of others, there is a time, a time when a nation properly makes war. In Genesis, we read about Abraham going to war. God's man, Abraham, his nephew Lot was captured along with many others and taken away captive. And Abraham rallied all of his men and went to war to get his nephew and those people back and free. There's a time for war. But Jesus said also, blessed are the peacemakers. And we should be people that work toward peace. Well, this completes the list of the 14 opposites, which Solomon says there is an appropriate time, an appropriate season for each side of the spectrum. There's some level of tension between each of these. Sometimes we don't know what the proper timing is. Though we may know something should be done, we might not know exactly what. Sometimes others have made choices that we feel are the wrong time. These kinds of experiences and lead us to feelings sometimes of struggle within. We all know and understand that change happens and change is inevitable. Change happens whether we accept it or not. Many of us have real struggles with change. Someone has said the problem with change is how we respond. Dr. Howard Hendricks, a longtime popular professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, said there are three stages people go through when confronted with change. First is resistance, resistance to change. Second is to tolerate change. And third is to embrace change. Even understanding this fact of life can help us to be patient with those who are in the first stage or even the second stage. They're struggling with change. And we can even become more empathetic about it. Whether we react fast or slow, God should always be our guide in times of change. Because it's easy to make wrong decisions. It's easy to move too slow, to drag our feet like they're cement in our shoes. And it's easy to move too fast. God's word is our best guide in times of change so we'll know how. I'm reminded in the book of Joshua that Joshua became the leader of Israel at a time of tumultuous change. 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and then Moses dies and God tells Joshua, now you're to lead these people and I want you to lead them into the promised land. Wow, what a task. What a big change was moving upon these people. Joshua was preparing to lead them and in chapter 3 it says, that God told him what to do. And he told them that they were to go a certain way and to follow this fashion. And so Joshua said to the people who've been camping in the wilderness, you don't know the way to go, but here's how we know the way to go. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord being carried by the Levitical priests, then you're to set out and follow it so that you will know the way you should go for you've never been this way before. In essence, Joshua was saying, look to God and follow his guiding hand that you may know the way to go. That ark represented the presence of the Lord and they would have followed the presence, follow the Lord. Solomon says there's a right time and a right season for all things described in this chapter. Timing of change is a big issue. And using agriculture again, trying to plant a crop in the wrong season is pretty useless. It's a waste of time and effort. If we were to go out in the middle of December or January, 
especially January, and start trying to dig in the ground. It's a waste of time. Some of the problems of life are that we try to run on our own schedule rather than God's schedule. But God has already planned a schedule and a season. It says he has made things beautiful in its time. God has planned a schedule. There's an appropriate time for everything, and so it is with our lives. Trying to do things in the wrong season or out of season only becomes frustrating. There is such a thing as going ahead or lagging behind. For many years, I sat under the wonderful ministry of Pastor Tim Fox. He pastored in Oxford, Maine for a long time, and he said, he used to say this often, it's important to learn to walk in the rhythm and flow of the Holy Spirit. To walk in the rhythm and flow of the Holy Spirit or staying in step with the Holy Spirit. Not running ahead because then you leave people behind or not lagging behind because then you lose touch with the Spirit. In verse 9, Solomon asked, well, this was the from Joshua, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord being carried by the Levitical priest, then you set out and follow it so that you will know the way you should go, for you have never been this way before. They would have followed the Lord. Well, Solomon says, what does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid upon men. People give much of their lives to their labor or work. And what do they get out of it? This is a good question and something that he wrestled with in this book. And in the next verse, he gives us more insight. He says, God has made everything fit beautifully in its opportune time, its appropriate time. But he's also placed eternity in the human heart so that people cannot discover what God has ordained from the beginning to the end of their lives. With careful study, Solomon observed that God can make things beautifully fit together when appropriate to do so. He has eternity to work with, and he's given us a curiosity about tomorrow and about all our tomorrows, about what he might do with our lives. While God has not given us every detail of our tomorrows, he can and will lead us. And he will recreate something beautiful, even out of the brokenness of our lives. So there's a real nugget here. Solomon notes that God has placed eternity in the hearts of men. There is within each person an insight that there's more, even a longing for that more. And it must be sought after, searched out. We can't understand it all, but we can continue to seek it through reading and studying God's word, and we gain much insight through it as he reveals it to us. Finally, Solomon gives us this, I know that there's nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live. Many people are seeking after happiness, but they're not finding it. What a burden. Could it be that they're looking for it in all the wrong places, in the wrong way, striving but not finding? Many people are striving for things like money and power and honor and glory. And while they may find some of these things in their life, they find when they achieve them, they were, as Solomon said, vanity. It seems that they often struggle to find any true happiness, and that's why they keep searching. Well, a few conclusions about change. God knows you. God knows us. And he knows that we don't always get it right. Our timing is off sometimes. We sometimes pluck when we should plant. We sometimes laugh when we should be weeping. We sometimes speak when we should be silent. But God knows the proper time. God knows when it's time for us to be born, and he knows when it's time for us to die. And God knows when we need to cry and when we need to laugh. And God knows when we need to mourn and when we need to dance. 
God knows when we need to be silent, when we need to speak, and all of these things. God sees everything, not only the big things, but the little details of our lives. Everything unfolds in the light of eternity. And he's working on preparing a new home for us, a place untainted by missteps, mistimings, lost opportunities. All that will be past. Second, God has created a longing for something within us, something inside, a setting of eternity in the hearts of men. C.S. Lewis said, that the very fact that there is still a little bit of emptiness inside of everyone, even after becoming a Christian, argues for the existence of heaven. I'll say for eternity. A place where we long for God to make something beautiful out of all of our mistakes and failures. C.S. Lewis said, Our Heavenly Father has provided many delightful inns for us along our journey, but he takes great care to see that we do not mistake any of them for home, our eternal home. There's a longing for our eternal home that he's put inside of us. The third thing here I see is that there are some things in life we'll never know. We cannot know all the answers to all the challenges of life. There are times when we'll have to fly in the dark on some things. And it's a part of our faith walk. Living with unfulfilled expectations is a part of life. The issue then, am I going to desperately grab for life or will I humbly allow God to bring life to me? and fulfill my expectations as he planned. God makes life beautiful in his time. And those who are surrendered to him and his will live a life according to his time, God's timing and schedule. And this ultimately leads to beauty in our own lives. Today, would you like for God to begin making something beautiful out of your life? How about freedom from life's expectations and failures? Now is always the right time to ask God for his help and guidance. Let's pray. Our Father, I want to thank you for your word. Even in this book from the writings of a wise teacher, thank you for these verses of scripture that remind us that you have made everything beautiful in its appropriate time. Thank you for the reminder that you've also placed eternity in the hearts of men. Help us, Lord, to continue to seek you for every step we take, every breath we make. Help us to wait on you, O Lord. Help us to move when we need to move and to rest when we need to rest. Help us to listen to your still small voice and trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.